The last two programs held in San Francisco and in Hawaii are as wonderful as today's program undoubtedly will be. And the videos of them are available off our website, njchs.org. So when you get tired of listening to Fresh Air or Serial or some other podcast, um, add them to your rotation. Um, I think they're, they're charming and delightful and really wonderful, so I hope you'll enjoy them as much as we do. I also encourage you to support our mission by becoming a member or even just making a single donation, and we have forms that you can do that with or you can do it off our website, again, njchs.org, end of infomercial. I'll do some more extensive thank yous at the end, um, as a program like this takes a village to put on, and in addition to our fabulous panelists, we're also indebted to our reception co-hosts. I know you all enjoyed the reception jams and also the California Lawyers Association, CLA Business Law Section, um, and its chair, Monique Jewett Brewster, who are proud to co-sponsor this event. The CLA is a nonprofit organization formed in 2018 and is comprised of the State Bar of California Sections, which became part of the CLA this year pursuant to California legislation. Um, I invite Corey Weber, who's here. Corey, can you... Thank you, right there in the back, um, to stand up so that if you have any more questions about the CLA, you can ask him. I'll also take a moment to thank all of the court staff who assisted us today, but a special thanks to Pamela Gamble-Jackson for her tireless efforts. Um, with that, I turn the program over to our moderator, Chief Judge Phillips, who needs no intro, so I'll just provide this very brief one. Um, Chief Judge Phillips served on the California Superior Court for four years before she joined the federal bench as a magistrate judge. She was appointed to the district court by President Clinton in November 1999, and she became the chief judge of the Central District in 2016. We're so thrilled to have her with us. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, and thank you for organizing this um, terrific program. Um, Robin's ascent to uh, the position of the executive director of the NJCHS <laughs> has proved to be a wonderful thing, and um, you know, all the programs that I have gone to that she has put together have been terrific. And I echo you in thanking uh, the clerk's office staff and, and Pamela Gamble-Jackson, who makes all these events go very smoothly. Finally, uh, for those of you who attended in order to meet and hear from Nicole Duckett Frick, I'm sorry, you may have noticed she's not here. <laughs> so if you want to quietly leave now, we'd understand. Uh, she was uh, very sorry that she couldn't make it tonight and um, asked me to give her regrets. So I want to start out by um, asking um, our panelists, what was the biggest challenge that you faced as a woman at the beginning of your career, the biggest challenge in how you overcame it? And I'll start with Gail Title. Um, Gail, you've had a number of uh, incredible roles in first. You were the first uh, female federal public defender in the Central District, the first uh, female partner in your law firm, and the first uh, lawyer at your law firm to have a baby. True. So I don't know which of those was your challenge, but. So you want to know what my biggest challenge was? Um, I think my biggest challenge was myself, truthfully. Um, I came from a background where, you know, my parents, there was nothing that I shouldn't be able to do. There was no, there's no discussion even that as a woman I would do anything different from what a son would have done. And I went to an all-women's college, Wellesley, where we were taught to, that we were just as good as everybody else and to take on leadership roles. And yet, when I was in law school and I got called on uh, that first year spring semester, I practically fainted. I was so scared. And when I started practicing at the Federal Public Defender's Office, it was really, I was terrified. I was terrified, and I don't know if it's any different if you're a guy, but I will say I felt like I had to know everything, and I had to know every, do everything right. And the third day of my being at the Federal Public Defender's Office, I was told that I was going down to the lockup to meet my first client. And I said, no, 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 you got to come with me. you got to come with me. This was Michael Lightfoot. And he says, why? And I said, well, what if he asks me a question that I don't know the answer to? And he said, lady, he's never had any decent representation in his life. 
you can go and talk to him. It doesn't matter. You'll be okay. But that, I think, is the biggest, the biggest thing for me was that every step of the way, feeling really anxious about not knowing. And I think that I probably was more anxious than a guy would have been in my position. So I think that my biggest challenge was getting to accept the fact that, yeah, I was scared, but I need to take a deep breath, and I need to just do it and stay grounded, and it's going to work out. And with each job that I had, the panic was less. It's still at the first, at the initial stage, it still was anxiety time, but it got less and less and less. And um, uh, so there's this expression about fake it till you make it, you know? And there's a little course, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm talking for too long, but I do think there's something to pretending that you're braver than you are and just playing the role and growing into your own self. So I think that happens. That's wonderful. Well, Andrea, as the first uh, female U.S. attorney in our district, and many first, uh, first woman to serve as county counsel for L.A. County and so on. What's your story? Well, my story is a little bit different because I never really thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be an actress. <laughs> and I worked very hard at wanting to be an actress. And uh, I had to work my way through school. And so both in undergrad, I was a Hollywood High graduate, so why would you expect anything different? Mm -hmm. uh, and I worked my way through, first as a, a, a receptionist in, in a law firm, and then uh, as a secretary. And by the time I was in law school, I was the uh, managing secretary administrator uh, for a law firm in, in Beverly Hills while I commuted to UCLA Law School. I hadn't really noticed until I graduated that they didn't have any women lawyers there. They didn't have any professors. They didn't have any deans. But it didn't make any real difference to me, you see, because I was going to be a lawyer, I was going to be an actress. And so this was a day job that perhaps I could get while I was becoming this great actress. Well, I continued to get 99 no's for every 100 auditions. And uh, so my whole life changed. And luckily, I was hired by the state attorney general's office. It was 1965. Before I got hired, I had more than a few interviews in the entertainment area because, as you will hear later, uh, some people actually did make it in the entertainment world. Uh, but I, I went first to William Morris, and the only job they were interested in was the mailroom, and I thought, gee, I've just had three years in law school. I'm not sure I want to go to the mailroom. And then I interviewed at my very first entertainment law uh, firm, and I was doing great with the, uh, the young partner. And I, I, you know, a lot of real, really good uh, interactions. And then the senior partner walked in, and he sat down. He didn't introduce himself, and he said, <clears throat> how do you get over the fact you're a woman? And this was 1965, and so, I hope I answered with a smile and said uh, something like, I don't intend to get over being a woman, but I think I can be, I can be a really good lawyer here, sir, something like that. And that firm did not hire their first woman for another eight years. Now, she was number one in her class at UT, and so uh, she certainly did very well. So my challenge really was in many ways just what Gail said, it's yourself. It's, we knew it was a world in the 60s that women were not in those careers, but my biggest challenge also was would have done, should have done, just my own sense of self in doing the kind of thing that, that 
I would be proud of. And I was fortunate enough to be in the state attorney general's office. My whole life changed. I uh, worked with many people who also were excluded. And fortunate to work with Lauren Miller Jr. And fortunate to work with Wally Tashima. People who did not, could not get into the big firms or could not get into any of the private firms. And uh, Sam Williams, many of you know here, was the first black partner uh, on Spring Street and the Huffstetler firm, uh, head of the state bar, all of those things. That There was this cadre of people who were not in the private firms and suddenly becoming involved in, in issues of policy. And uh, so it was, it was a great experience. But my, my biggest challenge was a personal one, and, and, and the same thing, that uh, sometimes worrying too much, sometimes thinking, I should have done it that way. I might have done it the other way. Um, and it was so known that we were the first and that the, 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 the we, it, it, in some ways, I almost got a benefit of that because the expectations were so low <laughs> that when we did what you would expect us to do and performed at the level, people started talking about it. And you would be pointed out as achieving whatever you'd achieved. So, there were lots and lots of individual challenges, but I think the same answer. The challenges are to be confident of yourself, be able to balance the rest of your life, we may talk about that, and, and be the person you want to be to your partner, to your children, uh, to whoever, you're, to your friends. Thank you. And Rena Shaw, one of the um, uh, first entertainment lawyers in the entertainment law section at O'Melveny and Myers and formed your own law firm and a real leader and star in, that's a bad pun, in entertainment law. What was your biggest <laughs> challenge and how did you overcome it? Um, I th first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here to sit among all these illustrious litigators because I am just a transactional lawyer. <laughs> fighting for the best credit and trailers <laughs> my clients are entitled to um, every day. Um, and thank you so much for saying Lauren Miller's name. You know, that's a name you sh all should know. Look at L-O-R-E-N, look it up. It's just such an important person in the history of, of black lawyers, just so important. Um, I think sometimes, um, the good and the bad part about being a person of color is that, you know, you can't really figure out why people don't like you. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. So I don't think I was focused as much about being a woman and being excluded for being a woman because I could never figure out why I was being excluded. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, but it, there really is some truth to that. Um, so. It's so funny, when you asked me this question about being one of the first women in the entertainment practice at O'Melveny, I was like, mm, I don't think that's true. But then I thought, who else was there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it probably was true, but I don't think I was that focused on it because I was also like the first black person in the entertainment practice at O'Melveny. So I was like, um, although I did come into the practice at the same time as uh, with another black lawyer, so we were the first two together. Um, uh, but then there were only like four or five of us in the entire firm, so <laughs> that was. So, so I don't have the same sense of being like, like so concerned about being a woman in all of this. Um, and I don't also, I didn't also have the sense of, of like self-doubt in that way. And it's not because I was extremely confident, because I wasn't. I think it was because, you know, I had grown up, I, I'm, I'm from New York. Um, I'm, I was born and raised in Harlem, um, Barnard uh, College. Yeah, shout out for all us Barnard girls. Um, and I, you know, every step of the way, if you can imagine, this is, you know, the mid 70s, mid to late 70s, I was always like the first of whatever. You know what I mean? Everywhere I was the first. So I didn't, I didn't lack confidence because like, you know, there was a reason I was the first, right? <laughs> um, part, part of it was discrimination, but part of it was because I was like really good and smart and 
wily and all of these other things. So I, I don't have that, I don't identify with that in the same way. Um, and the funny thing about it is, you know, so few of us know really a lot about our own histories and, and fewer of us sometimes know a lot about American history. But uh, one of the things people would often say to me is, oh, your family must be so proud of you. And I would say, of course they are. And they would say um, things like, oh, you must be the first college graduate in your family. And I was like the fifth generation of college <laughs> graduates in my family. I was like the first person. I was the first generation. My sister and I were the first generation not to go to historically black colleges. That was like our big thing, <laughs> you know. Um, so all of those things, I think, combine to make me feel very comfortable that I belong there. Uh, I think what was often um, very difficult for me was when someone would discriminate against me because it would just occur to me after the fact that they were discriminating against me. I was like, because I was, I was just not accustomed to not being the best and the brightest at everything. So when I left O'Mel, I left O'Melveny after three years, which is about right. I was in the entertainment department at O'Melveny. I was working primarily on Norman Lear projects. Um, although O'Melveny at that time had less of a corporate practice and more of a, a talent-driven practice, with Norman and uh, Bud Yorkin being their their biggest clients. So I was working on all those shows: uh, The Jeffersons, The Facts of Life, Different Strokes. Come on, take you through your childhood. Um, <laughs> And um, so I was really, and it was very intense. Norman and Bud were often doing things that were groundbreaking in the entertainment business. So I was seeing a lot of things that other lawyers weren't seeing. I was involved in um, the, the concept of spin-off shows, of compilation shows, of going to the guilds and, and negotiating deals for types of shows that never happened. So I was really at the cutting edge of a lot of what was being done in a transactional um, entertainment practice on the television side. So I felt that when I came out of that practice, and there was kind of this thing where you came out and you went into the boutique firms, um, and I was really, really surprised when I couldn't get a job. Um, I mean, I was genuinely surprised because I was clearly like among the best candidates that they were seeing, and I was seeing other people getting jobs who didn't have my credentials and didn't have my experience. And then I think that was kind of an aha moment for me that it was going to be, um, that my ultimate career path was going to be more difficult than perhaps I had anticipated from all of the, you know, good things that were happening to me before I, I went to, you know, the, the left a big firm to go. And I mean, it all worked out. I got a job and then I, you know, I was about 10 years into my practice when I started the firm I have now and it's a very successful firm. So, you know, all's well that end, ends well, I guess. But I was really, really surprised when I first started to get that first batch of rejection letters from, you know, this is from Ziffrin and Hirsch and all of the major <laughs> firms. See, I'm not like you. I name names. Um, I will tell you who sent me those rejection letters. But he, um, they, he was my classmate, you see. <laughs> yeah. So I really went out. You know, so that was, I think, the mm -hmm. difficult part. That uh, realizing that you know at some point I hit a I hit, not as so much hit a wall, but I I hit, hit the first time that just being the best at something didn't matter, and that was quite mm -hmm. that was quite a, a revelation. And yet she persisted. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a it's, it's a wonderful audience and uh, a lot of different. Um, uh, generations, I think, represented. But this question, I, I think, the next question I want to pose to our panel, I think, will be of maybe most interest to the newer lawyers in the room, and that is, what do you know now that you wish you had known then when you graduated and started practicing? Nina? That like 99% of the stuff you worry about doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. She took really my doesn't. answer. <laughs> really doesn't. I mean, I think about the stuff I worried about. Did I write this memo well? Did I do this? Did I, you know, it's just so much in life. Do you realize when you get older, it's too bad you have to get older to realize it. Right. That it just doesn't, a lot of it isn't going to matter. That the big things are the things that matter. Um, so I, I think that, but I know that's everyone's answer. So yeah. let me... But you got to go first. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think the other thing um, that I wish I had, I wish I, had, you know, because there wasn't social media and all the rest of that, I really did not know much about the culture of um, uh, outside of what I had experienced. So I had grown up in Harlem, and my family was from Virginia, from Charlottesville, now a city that everyone knows. 
Um, and I knew a lot about what was happening in my community, and we read the newspapers every day, so I knew a lot about that. But because you know it was such a segregated world that I came up in, I didn't really know a lot about how other people lived. So I didn't know, for example, I was in like in high school before I met um, someone who had a, a mother who uh, didn't work outside of the home. Like all the moms where I grew up worked outside of the home. So I didn't realize that women actually stayed home. Like my mom worked, my grandmother worked, my great grandmother worked. Um, everyone worked and I just thought that that was what all women did. So I wish I had been more worldly. I had never traveled. Um, like when I came to uh, Los Angeles to work at O'Melveny, it was like maybe the second time I'd ever been on an airplane. Um, I certainly had never, except a, a trip, some church trips to like Montreal, which you know, when you, if you're in New York, it's not like a huge trip. I'd never been outside of the United States. Um, there was just so much I wish I had known more about the world, that I'd had more exposure. So I'll tell you my, I'll stop, I'll tell you my really funny story. So when I was at Barnard, my first year at Barnard, which you know has a very a good cross-section of women, a number of whom are very wealthy, I had a roommate who came from Shaker Heights, Ohio, and she said to me, what do you guys do in the Big Apple? I didn't even know what the Big Apple was. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what do you do in the Big Apple? Okay, so anyway, I figured out it was New York. And so I said, well, you know, one of my favorite things, and so one of my favorite things was to go to the East Side Airline Terminal if, this is a very New York thing. It was a terminal where you took the, the bus to the airport. Because one of my uncles was a um, porter there. Like, you know, he put your bags and stuff there. So he would, um, I would get on the bus, and he, the guy who ran it would give me a Coca-Cola and a straw, and then I would drive to, ride to the airport, and I would watch planes take off and come back. <laughs> and then I would, then I'd come back. to <laughs> So I told my friend, I said, oh, you know, you know what one of the most... <laughs> <laughs> you know one of the most fun things to do when you work? <laughs> and I went, to, we went to the East Side Airline Terminal, and we rode out to LaGuardia with our Coca-Colas, and then we rode back. And she was from like Shaker Heights, Ohio, which I, now, I later came to understand was a very wealthy community in Ohio. And years later at a Barnard reunion, she told me that when she came home that night, she called her mother. And she, <laughs> and she told her mother the story, and her mother said that was one of the most endearing things that she had. <laughs> but I wish I'd known more about the world. <laughs> That's a great, a great story. Uh, Andrea? Well, well she, her f very first answer was, uh, was my, my same one. And in, in terms of the kind of agonizing uh, over decisions, I, you might have noticed with all the things I've done, uh, all the different kinds of jobs I've held, I've never been a judge. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with one of my qualities of hamleting certain kinds of decisions, which would be very annoying by a, a, a judge. Uh, and, and my hope all always was, and, and, and in the places that I've worked, I've tried to put people around a table and see if we can't come to a, to a decision, and I'm much more comfortable in, in that kind of role. But I, I do think that that sort of feeling, I mean, everybody says in, in oral arguments, uh, there are three arguments. The, the first is the one that you've practiced, and, and the, uh, the second one is the one that you give, and of course the third one, which is the right one, is the one that you give as you're driving back home. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so I have more than a little of, of, of that, uh, that quality. And so to, to be able to put things in perspective and not have that intense feeling after whatever the, the final negotiation was or the Ninth Circuit argument was or, or whatever. So you know, to, to be able to put those, those things in perspective. Uh, my, my childhood was a little bit different in the sense that I saw more of the world, at least in New York and Los Angeles and Mexico than many. My mother was born in Amarillo and was a naturalized cis, uh, citizen. My father was born in either Ireland or England, depending on the story he told at the time. And uh, he was came as a visitor to this country and uh, never formalized his relationship with the United States. So my mother was a naturalized citizen, and my father from England or Ireland uh, was an illegal alien. Uh, 
But we moved a lot because they were very creative people. They did know a lot about the world and wrote about it and uh, were poet. Well, my mother was a poet and my uh, father uh, uh, writer. Uh, and they met in uh, uh, the studios as uh, studio uh, uh, writers at one, at one point. So, but we would, every time we got a check, we would move up. And then when we didn't, we would move down or somewhere else. So I went to about 10 or 11 schools. And so some of that balanced against uh, the, the 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 shoulda done woulda done kind of kind of issue, uh, really and truly, what would you know now that you wish you'd known? Same answer again as I started that uh, uh, to 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 put things in perspective and not not deal as much with uh, trying to correct whatever assumed fault you might have had. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what I think of this answer. In certain ways, I relate to Nina, and in certain ways, I relate to Andrea, because my parents were Holocaust survivors. I was born in Europe um, and came over here with nothing. Um, and on the one hand, I think because of that experience, I was fairly sophisticated, because we'd been through a lot. I knew a lot about the war. You know, my family had a big history that um, I was re-experiencing a lot growing up. So in that sense, I was pretty worldly. My dad and I, he was consumed with politics and law, and we argued day and night. That was very good training for me because we had these intellectual arguments from the time I was a little kid. Um, and so in that sense, I feel pretty, like I, I knew a lot. But on the other hand, I took my first plane ride when I went to college. And um, I'd never met a lawyer. When I went to Wellesley, I thought, oh my god, what do these people wear? How do they behave? I had no idea what to expect, because you know, my background was quite unsophisticated. Um, and yet, I learned a lot about American culture in college, I really did. Um, if you have girls, I recommend you send them to the East Coast to go to school. They will really get a lot out of it. Um, and so I, on the one hand, I felt like I was pretty spunky having spent all my time arguing with my dad. And on the other hand, I still had this other side which was scared out of my mind. And um, I think that actually it served me well because it allowed me to pretend I knew more than I knew, um, to take on people who were difficult. Um, and I think that if there's anything I know now that I was hesitant to know about then, it's you need to really have a sense of who you are, what you want, and you need to be able to go and say, this is what I want and I want your support. When I'm talking about careers now, I'm not talking about, well, it works with spouses too sometimes. <laughs> uh, but I really think that being able to be clear about what you want, who you are, and being able to ask for it and say, this is what I want and I want your support to help me get there is something that I wish I knew before. I mean, I think most of us here we just kind of put one foot in front of the other and saw what happened. You know, we try to figure it out on the way as we went along. Um, and so not having more kind of a structure to it might have been a little bit better. Yeah, and, and I think sophistication is a relative term because I, while I didn't know a lot about things outside of my own culture, I knew a lot about my own culture. Right. Um, and my, my mom... Um, was extraordinarily well read. She hadn't finished college. She was a civil servant. She worked in the post office and then in the Department of Motor Vehicles in New York. And she also did some um, community uh, organizing um, as as kind of the other thing that she did. So I had, and, and then my great, my grandmother was a nurse. She had gone to uh, Hampton uh, 
it's now in Hampton University, but at the time it was called Hampton Institute in Virginia, and she had then gone to Harlem Hospital and joined, you know, become a nurse there. And my great-grandmother had gone to Oval.